Welcome to another live broadcast from The Intercept. I'm Mehdi Hassan coming to you live uh, once again from my home because you know what? The coronavirus hasn't gone away, people. It really hasn't. Uh, in, recent, in recent weeks, though, it's been bumped from the top of the news agenda uh, by another public health crisis, another killer uh, of Americans, institutional racism, especially racist violence by the police uh, towards black people. Uh, even in the midst of this terrible pandemic, we have seen historic public protests against white supremacy and police brutality, not just across the nation, uh, but across the world. And so one of the things I want to talk about today is given this radical uh, historic moment that we're in, in our public life and our politics, do we have politicians? Do we have elected leaders who can respond in an appropriately radical and historic way? Are the Democrats going to lead the way on issues, not just of police reform or even defunding, but racism and inequality across the board? Jamal Bowman says he wants to be such a leader. Uh, he's an educator, a husband, a father of three, and a candidate of color running for Congress in New York's 16th Congressional District. He's trying to primary this guy. I got to then go down the list, and it's just too many folks here. But you didn't have a primary over here. Say that again? But you didn't have a primary over here. No. That, don't do that to me. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. That's Elliot Engel uh, caught on a hot mic saying he really doesn't care about turning up to events with activists. Uh, he's the hawkish Democratic chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee who's seeking his own 17th term in Congress and who easily defeated three primary challengers in 2018. But this time round, Jamal Bowman has momentum. He's been endorsed by Bernie Sanders and AOC just this week. He's been profiled in the New York Times. And I'm pleased to say he joins me now live from his home in New York. Jamal, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Jamal, let's get into it. Why are you a teacher, an educator running for Congress and that too against a Democratic incumbent who's a senior member of your own party, who's a committee chair, who's been representing that seat for more than 30 years? Well, as, as a teacher and as an educator and as a middle school principal, you develop an intimate understanding of what your children go through on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, children don't struggle in school by accident. They struggle because of poverty. They struggle because of concentrated trauma. They struggle because of neglect from their government in terms of resources and opportunity. So I've developed an intimate understanding of how that works and what that looks like because of the kids I've served. Over my 20 year career, I've served as a teacher, guidance counselor and middle school principal. And I've seen all of the issues intersect at my doorstep each and every day. And in 2017, 2018, 34 children died within the K to 12 school system in the Bronx and 17 died via suicide. So educators understand the connection between trauma, poverty and bad policy. And unfortunately, Elliot Engel hasn't been a leader on any of those issues over the course of his 31 year career. So just in terms of your own politics, before we get to you and Elliot Engel, just in terms of your own politics, uh, how would you describe your politics? Are you a Bernie Sanders AOC Democrat or do you differ with either of them on any major policies? I agree with them uh, for the most part in terms of my politics. You know, I believe healthcare is a human right. I believe housing is a human right. I believe our schools should be fully funded. I support universal health care and the Green New Deal. I believe simply that in the wealthiest nation on earth, we should not have anyone living in poverty, let alone 8 million children. And as the wealthiest nation on earth, we should be a leader when it comes to foreign policy and in terms of, in terms of humanitarian efforts and rebuilding the world as opposed to the imperialistic nature we've approached foreign policy and domestic affairs as well. So I want to talk about foreign policy and domestic affairs, but just sticking with your own politics, because we live in this yep. uh, age of labels, right? Are you a socialist? People want to know. You, you know, you've been endorsed by AOC and Bernie Sanders, two of the most famous socialists in the country. Yes. I'm, I'm an educator. Uh, it just so happens my policy aligns with socialism. So I guess I'm a socialist. Um, I'm a progressive, uh, left-leaning, uh, someone that fights for human rights. Um, I, I was never big on the label, labels at the beginning of this race. I identify as an educator and as a black man in America. Um, but my policies align with those of a socialist. 
Uh, so I guess that makes me a socialist. All good. Okay, all good. All yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone seriously questions that Elliot Engel, the incumbent in your district, is pretty out of touch uh, with his constituency. There's a debate about whether he even lives there. Uh, he was caught on a hot mic last week, as we saw a moment ago, saying, quote, if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. Um, he even said it twice, which was a great moment. Um, what are your own ties to that constituency, which, correct me if I'm wrong, contains a lot of rich constituents and a lot of poorer constituents? Yeah, not, not just rich. I mean, super wealthy. Uh, so the district, it, it's a tale of two districts. It's really a microcosm of America. We have incredible wealth in some areas with some of the highest real estate values uh, in the country. And we also have the highest number of WIC recipients of any congressional district uh, in the country. I live in Yonkers, uh, which is economically diverse. Uh, I'm a homeowner in Yonkers. I work in the Bronx, the North Bronx, which is also in the district, right around the corner from the ho a housing project. And uh, you know, I shop in different parts of the district. I take my kids to the parks in different parts of the district. So it's economically and racially diverse, but economically and racially segregated. And obviously poverty <clears throat> falls along racial lines. So the disproportionate number of people in this district that live in poverty are black and Latino. Um, it's also my upbringing. You know, I was raised by a single mom. I lived in public housing and rent stabilized apartments. She raised me and my three sisters on uh, a postal worker salary. So I come from and I represent, excuse me, I come from and I've worked in uh, a district like the one I'm trying to represent. So you mentioned race and racial segregation. Let's talk about the protests against racism that we've seen across this country uh, in recent weeks. What has been running through your mind as you've seen these thousands of people take to the streets, risking their lives even, in the midst of a pandemic? to stand up to police brutality, stand up to institutional racism. Did they take you by surprise, those protests? Absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, it's incredibly inspiring. It's incredibly empowering and uplifting. You know, people risking their health to go out there and protest police brutality. I mean, this is, this is the American way, right? The foundation of America is protesting uh, oppression from a foreign government, which was England, which we we then protested and fought against in the Revolutionary War to create our country. Thanks, but throughout that. American, but throughout Amer <laughs> but throughout American history, you know, whether it's the abolitionist movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ movement, every uh, American every American's history is rooted in protests and and standing up uh, to a government that's not meeting our needs and pushing elected officials to do the right thing in terms of policy and we're in one of those moments and it's unfortunate that we had to get here uh, by another black man being murdered uh, but we're here and, and it's really inspiring to see and i hope the policy comes with it and you personally have been on the receiving end of police violence uh, and racism both as a child when you say you were shoved and pushed around by the police and as an adult uh, when you were arrested, I believe, on suspicion of stealing your own car in front of your son and then released without charge or apology. How traumatic are episodes like that for people such as yourself? Well, you know, African-Americans, black people in this country, we live with a collective trauma on a day to day basis because of America's history of racism and lynching and targeting us uh, for the simple fact of the color of our skin. Uh, so, you know, police brutality and police harassment is a way of life uh, for black people. And it's incredibly traumatizing. I can't tell you how many parents, particularly mothers, who just want to have conversations with me about what should they tell their sons in terms of how to engage, uh, not just with police, but how to engage in America overall. Because, you know, this is not just about police brutality. This is about institutional racism. It exists with, with, within our schools in terms of miseducation. It exists in our healthcare system where we saw the disparities related to COVID and the, the, the disparities were there prior to that. It exists within our job market in terms of hiring. It exists within economic inequality in terms of wealth. In every American institution, you see examples of racial inequality and structural racism. Uh, so, you know, the parents I speak to often want to talk about what do I tell my son? You know, how do I raise him in this society? So it's a collective trauma that's passed down generation to generation, and it's almost become ancestral at this point. 
What have you told your kids in recent weeks? You know, I have three kids. My oldest is 19. Uh, my, my daughter is uh, six. She's the youngest. And my middle child, Marcel, is 10. And for the 10-year-old and six-year-old, I try to do my best to allow them to just be kids and keep them away from this stuff so, they, so that they can grow up free without the trauma and the burden of living in a racist society. My oldest son, I mean, I've tried to educate him throughout his upbringing on, on institutional racism, on the brilliance and power of African civilization and how African civilization has contributed to, what, contributed to Western civilization. Because, you know, in schools, often when you learn about black history, you learn that your history started with slavery and that your ancestors were traded for spices. And that's all uh, your history is about. But that's not true. You know, African civilizations have contributed to Western civilization as well and the birth of Western civilization. So I tell him about his history and his culture because I want him to grow up free and empowered and enlightened and as a humanitarian. And, and, and I'm proud that he has been participating in protests you know, where he lives outside of his school, et cetera. And he's been a part of this movement as well. Just back to the subject of police racism and police brutality itself. There's been a lot of talk in recent weeks about defunding the police or even abolishing uh, the police, which your party leaders have firmly rejected. Do either of those <laughs> proposals appeal to you? Do they have your support? <laughs> they both appeal to me. Uh, I've called for defunding the police because we need to allocate, reallocate those resources toward public health. We need to reallocate towards jobs. We need to reallocate towards healthcare, education, housing, environmental justice. We need to give people the resources they need to live with dignity and collective actualization. If we provide those resources, there's no need to have as many police as we have, and there's definitely no need to uh, have militarized police forces. So defunding is about reallocation. You defunding is about ending the transfer of uh, military uh, armory to police, uh, local police forces. It's about a total dismantling and rebuilding of what we, of what we call not just policing, but public health. But do you believe that's an argument that's easy to make? Because once you get into it, as you mentioned, you have a lot of rich white folks in your constituency. You, a black guy running for Congress, telling them, you know what, I want to defund, dismantle the police. That's going to send people running, whether the merit, regardless of the merits of the case, just the perception, the messaging. You know and I know a lot of rich white folks, they want the police to stick around. Well, a lot of rich white folks also are marching and protesting against police brutality right here in this district. Fair. A lot of rich white folks are, are, are chanting Black Lives Matter. Uh, I spoke at one of the wealthiest uh, parts of this district uh, a couple of weeks ago at a Black Lives Matter vigil uh, about being black in America and about what's happening. So it's, I mean, this, this movement has taken everyone by storm. And there are many white people, middle class, rich, poor, who support revamping and dismantling what we have currently as a police force and reallocating resources towards public health. Okay. Uh, how seriously, let's talk politics, how seriously has the Democratic Party, in your view, taken racism in America, especially of the police uh, violence kind? I mean, the last Democratic president was, of course, a black man, but I don't think anyone uh, is going to pretend racism disappeared on his watch, least of all him, or that race relations in America improved during his eight years in office. In fact, uh, the black wealth gap was pretty bad both at the beginning and at the end of his eight years in office. I mean, we've been, the Democratic Party has been very reactive when it comes to racism in this country. And, you know, I would never, I would not call a Democratic Party a racist party. They are not. Uh, and, and they have, and we have acknowledged uh, racism historically in this country. The acknowledgement is there. Um, however, we haven't moved forward with HR 40 in terms of a true study of the impact and the legacy of racism in this, racism in this country towards a reparation, rape reparations bill. We haven't moved far enough on that. Uh, we also haven't called it out and, and spoken about racism, institutional racism uh, directly enough. And I think the tides are turning now, it's shifting. Uh, our campaign has spoken about structural raci racism from the very beginning, uh, and we, we're gonna, we hope to push the Democratic Party and the country overall to center institutional racism because it's, it's, the, it's the original sin of this country. And in order for us to move forward to create a democracy, 
that works for everyone. We have to deal with it directly and honestly. You mentioned you don't think the Democratic Party is a racist party. Do you think the Republican Party is a racist party? <laughs> Donald Trump is a racist, uh, and many within that party support his policies, Mitch McConnell and many others. Um, so there, there's racism throughout the part, throughout the Republican Party for sure. I think there's also a lot of implicit bias and, and the impact of white superiority, superiority and white supremacy uh, within that party, just the way it is throughout the country. Um, so I wouldn't call the party a racist, but Donald Trump and those who support him uh, are definitely racist. Um, the New York Times recently referred to as possibly the next AOC, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, of course, shocked the political world back in 2018 when she defeated 10-term House incumbent Joe Crowley, also in New York. Um, now, there have been some pretty high-profile leftist uh, insurgent candidates who have tried to take on centrist Democratic incumbents since then, who have tried to follow in AOC's footsteps. Many of them failed. Uh, Jamal, why are you different? Why do you think you're going to win? Well, we've been running a very strong campaign uh, from the very beginning. We have an amazing team in place. I mean, the best team a candidate can ask for. You know, we're smart, we're organized, we're united, uh, and we work our butts off. And from the very beginning, we've been canvassing the entire district uh, in every corner of the district, but particularly targeting uh, historically uh, ignored communities and communities that Elliot Engel has ignored. Um, we have thousands of volunteers, I mean, literally thousands uh, who are part of a phone banking operation. Uh, our fundraising numbers are looking good. Our positive IDs are looking good. And uh, just recently, over the last couple couple of weeks, you know, we've gotten a, a tremendous amount of momentum. Uh, so we're right there. We're neck and neck, and, and, and we feel we have a shot. But the main reason is because we have an amazing team working their butts off, and, uh, you know, we like our chances. Uh, you were endorsed by AOC this week. What role do you think she's played and her squad has played in changing the Democratic Party, both at a grassroots level and on Capitol Hill? Because a lot of establishment Democrats, a lot of pundits, they say, oh, we focus too much on these four outspoken women. They, rep they represent a tiny minority of Democratic voters. What do you say in response to that? Uh, polling shows differently. It shows that the American people feel uh, with the ideas of the squad and Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, they've broken through a glass ceiling. I mean, we're talking about four women of color existing within a white supremacy patriarchy and, and just destroying it left and right by speaking truth to power. They created a platform and a lane for someone like me to even run for office and, and to feel confident speaking about structural racism and uplifting uh, the working class in the way that I do. Uh, these are conversations that I've been happening, having in education for the last 20 years. And what they've done is they created a political platform and space for people like me to have those conversations within politics. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been invigorating and inspiring to watch their leadership uh, from afar. And I hope to call them colleagues uh, over the next, in the, within the next 12 days. So you hope to call them colleagues, you want to be working with them in Congress. Um, one of the issues that uh, is big for your campaign, unlike a lot of other primary campaigns, is foreign policy. Uh, a lot of young men and women running for Congress are keen to talk about domestic policy, minimum wage, schools, Medicare for all, but they shy away from foreign policy. It's not something most House members or wannabe House members like talking about. You're trying to unseat the chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee, Elliot Engel, who is so hawkish, he not only voted for George Bush's invasion of Iraq, but he also opposed uh, Barack Obama's Iran nuclear deal. How much are you trying to draw a clear blue line between you and Engel on foreign policy specifically? Well, first of all, we don't take any money from corporate PACs at all. Uh, he's completely funded by corporate PACs and big donors. Uh, and many of those corporate PACs are weapons manufacturers. Uh, we will never take a dime from weapons manufacturers as long as I remain in politics. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, you know, he allowed the sale of cluster bombs to Saudi Arabia, which they then used to bomb Yemen into a humanitarian crisis. That's just something I never would have done as a member of Congress. I would never have uh, gone against Ob Obama's Iran deal, and I would never have voted for the war in Iraq. And, you know, it's funny, you know, in 2001, uh, 
May 2001, my son was born, my first child was born. And then September 11th happened. I remember paying attention to the news and reading publications and there was no evidence that we should have gone to war in Iraq at all. And unfortunately, and people don't know this, he was in a minority of House Democrats voting in favor of that war, um, but he voted for it. That's why we know him as being hawkish. My vision and my focus on foreign policy is diplomacy, is peace, is decreasing military spending dramatically, and is focused on a global Green New Deal and a 21st century Marshall Plan so we can rebuild the economies and political systems that we have destroyed, uh, not just in the Middle East, but in Central and South America, as well as Africa. America needs to be a humanitarian leader, uh, and we haven't done enough uh, in that regard throughout our nation's history. We've been involved in military conflicts of some sort for 93% of our existence at the tune of tens of trillions of dollars. It's just wasteful. And we're a nation where we have more military, excuse me, we have more nuclear weapons than we do hospitals. So we're morally bankrupt in terms of how we approach foreign policy and our imperialistic nature. We need to focus on peace. We need to focus on climate. And we need to focus on rebuilding what we've destroyed all across this planet. So a powerful vision there. I think what a lot of people, wherever they are on the political spectrum, would sign up for. We know that a lot of Republicans don't want as much spending on the Pentagon uh, as there is. But do people care when it comes to voting? Is it one of the problems for progressives who try and shift the discourse on US foreign policy that most voters don't care about foreign policy? They don't vote based on foreign policy. Is that what you've experienced too out on the campaign trail on the doorstep? Well, it depends. Uh, there are some people, uh, some constituents within this district who care very much about foreign policy. But to your point, the majority care more about domestic policy because it's right in front of them. They want to put food on the table. They want to keep yeah. a roof over their head. They want a quality education and they want, and they want uh, an environment that's clean and safe. What I try to do is make the connection between uh, overspending on war and weapons and foreign policy and how those resources can be reallocated toward our communities if we change our, if we center our values on human rights, equality and justice. So that's how I try to bridge the gap. We are being wasteful in terms of Pentagon spending. We are being, we are spending, we are spending more in our military than the next seven countries combined. Uh, and we have more nuclear weapons than we, than we know what to do with, right? So let's reallocate those resources, focus on peace, and really rebuild the communities and infrastructures in our district and across the country that are crumbling. So bridging that gap has been helpful. And what, what we've seen, not just from the Democratic Party, but from the Republican Party and elected officials in general, there's a disconnect between the work they're doing in Washington and the people in their district. You got to meet people where they are, listen to where they are, listen to their concerns, have conversations, and then bridge the gap between not just foreign policy and domestic policy, but what's happening in Washington and what's happening on the ground in our district. So tell me, tell us about a foreign policy issue that you would like to champion on Capitol Hill in the House once you've replaced the current chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee that isn't really being championed right now, that needs a new voice in Congress? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I would be a part of the uh, <laughs> of the um, of that committee. I don't think they allow freshmen on that committee. But the focus of mine would be a 21st century Marshall Plan. Um, you know, we had we implemented a Marshall Plan after World War II to help uh, Europe recover um, from that heinous war, from that horrible war. We need a 21st century Marshall Plan right now to help rebuild the Middle East, to rebuild Central and South America and a focus on putting the weapons down, ending the forever wars, and focus on diplomacy and peace and negotiating in good faith. Uh, that's not something that's being championed because the weapons manufacturing in industry has such a hold on our elected officials. That's why the Pentagon budget continues to go up and we continue to facil facilitate conflict in different parts of the world. My vision is a 21st century Marshall Plan that focuses on diplomacy, peace, and rebuilding the world. One thing I noticed when I was uh, reading up on your speeches and your campaign materials is uh, you've been outspoken on the issue of Palestine and human rights for Palestinians, which is not something you hear very often in US politics across the political spectrum, sadly. We've seen what happened to Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib from the squad, freshman congressmen, uh, congresswomen when they were elected in 2018, when they spoke out uh, uh, in criticism of Israel 
uh, in defense of Palestinians. Um, are you ready for what's coming your way if you get elected and start talking about Palestinian rights <laughs> in a place, Congress, which has been I very mean, hostile towards Palestinian rights in recent years? No. I mean, listen, we're talking about human rights, human rights, equality and justice for all people, Palestinians included, people of Israel included. We're not excluding them. The point is, when the Israeli government, Netanyahu in particular, is committing human rights violations, we have to have honest conversations about that. The same way we have honest conversations about human rights violations in Saudi Arabia or human rights violations in Egypt or anywhere else in the world. If we're going to be a leader of, uh, on human rights and humanity, we have to have honest conversations about that. Doesn't mean we don't want to maintain a quality relationship with Israel and we don't recognize Israel's right to exist and have safety and security, absolutely. But if human rights violations are, are occurring on a consistent basis, that has to be called out because that impacts the safety and security of all of us uh, going forward. So, you know, centering human rights and humanity and equality and justice is what I'm always gonna do, regardless of people or place, uh, because that's where my values are rooted. You have a democratic presidential candidate right now, Jamal, who is of course, far superior to Donald Trump in almost every way. I mean, you could pull out a name from the phone book at random and there'd be a better president than the current guy in the Oval Office. But Biden, Joe <laughs> Biden, is also a politician with a long record of pro-corporate, uh, pro-police policies at home, hawkish, warmongering, Engel-style policies abroad. How do you get more progressive Democrats, progressive Democratic voters who have serious concerns with Biden, how do you get them to turn out and vote for Biden in November? We have to beat Trump. I mean, that, that's first and foremost. To your point, he's, he's the worst president in the history of this country. So beating Trump is of epic proportions. It has to be done. And Biden is not perfect, but he's going to be a lot better than Trump. So we have to be honest about that. We have to organize around that, and we have to get him into office. But we also have to hold him accountable to the progressive values that we are all fighting for and make sure that he moves in the direction that the majority of the American people want. The majority of the American people support universal health care through Medicare for all. They support a Green yep. New Deal and a federal jobs guarantee. They support fully funding our schools. It's about put pressuring him and mobilizing to push him in a direction that the American people want. So it's not just about getting him in, into office, it's about holding him accountable and every other elected official accountable, not just at, at the congressional level, but at the state and city levels as well. We need everyone involved in our democracy. If we can make that happen, this country will move in the direction it needs to go. Jamal, one last question for you. If you yourself yes, sir. don't win on June 23rd, the date of the the date of the coming Democratic congressional primary in your district. If you don't win on June 23rd, are you going to try again later in this seat or another seat? Or are you done? Is this it? It's all or nothing for Jamal Bowman in 2020. <laughs> well, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, but my fight and my work uh, for racial and economic ju justice, my work uh, for peace uh, throughout the world, my work in, in supporting children and families who are disenfranchised, that work will never stop. I will always do that work in some capacity. Uh, but we plan on winning, so let's not, uh, <laughs> if we lose. We got 12 days of grinding and we like our chances, so we see where we land. Jamal, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy campaigning schedule to join us and to uh, take my questions. We appreciate your time. And thank you all Absolutely. for watching thank at you, home. Brother. Appreciate Please it. do consider becoming subscribers members and take care stay safe goodbye